Hi, Jeremy, just for logistics, should, um, can I control the um, the PowerPoint that I gave you, or, or, or am I going to ask you to um, to advance the slides when I'm ready? You know, I'll make you a moderator here. I'm looking for you on the list. John, here it is. Okay, yeah, I'll make you a moderator, and then you can use the forward and backward arrow. Okay, great. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, I mean, I should. Okay, I see that I'm a moderator. I, I should just say hello to everybody. I'm not. Um, hopefully, I, you'll be able to understand why I'm saying I'm. I'm new to um, Illuminate. I've done this, I think, one time before. Um, you know, as Jeremy um, said, I was. I going to talk about LibGuides. And, and the way I'm going to do this, I, I realize that you guys are doing a lot of looking at um, interface design and a lot of the details of design. I, what I'm interested in right now is sort of the, you know, how something like LibGuides fits into the big picture of, of what um, libraries do. Um, you know, at the end, if, if people have questions about the details about the interface of LibGuides, I'd be happy to hear them. Or, or if people have suggestions for how to make it better, I'd be happy to hear that too. Um, also, you know, Jeremy mentioned lots. Um, you, I'm sure at this point you guys know a lot more about the lots tutorial than I do. I, I, I wasn't involved in creating that. I, um, I've done it one time, but I'm, I'm happy to, you know, be here and take notes on what you guys have, what you guys could suggest to us about improving that or using that interface as well. Um, so anyway, I'll just go ahead um, and get started with my um, my presentation here. Let's see if I can move the slide up. Um, and, and I see, actually, I see a lot of people here, so I'm, uh, I'm glad that there's so many people that have come in and are, are interested in this. It's, just, it's really impressive for me, to me to see. Let me go to the next slide. Okay, it works. So, so I thought before I get started on this, guys, I'd just um, give you a little bit of background on, on myself, because I think you know, people in library school are kind of interested in what kind of happens after you get out of library school and you know, how people get into different jobs. So I can tell you a little bit about myself. Um, um, as you can see, I, like a lot of people who end up working in libraries, I've kind of get, I didn't go directly into libraries. I kind of had this kind of varied background. I, I, you know, I actually started out studying um, history. I was a, did my PhD in history at the University of Rochester, and 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 basically. Um, I couldn't get a job I'm teaching history at that time in 1998, and so I kind of just fell into working in libraries because I already liked to read. I was was doing a lot of reading for my for my dissertation, so I ended up you know working in libraries. And and after a little while, I figured out that um, if I'm going to be working in libraries anyway, I might as well you know get my degree in library school so that I can you know potentially get a better job. So I was working over in Berkeley at the Bancroft Library and they and they they actually paid for me to go to the um SLIS and I I think it was 2004 when I graduated um and I I I also believe that I took a class called 250 uh a, in 251 class at some point. It wasn't it wasn't taught by Jeremy at that time. I I took a class by Linda May and I think some I think Linda May is still a teacher there and I think some of you may may know her. I mean she was she was a great teacher. Uh, I took three classes of Linda Mains while I was in school, um, so um, so I won't take I won't bore you with, with my life story. But right after I got out of um, graduated from uh, SLIS, I, my first job was actually was at Innovative Interfaces, where I worked as a systems librarian. And I and and I think for people who are in this class who seem to be interested in, in you know in Interfaces and kind of the technical aspects of librarianship. Some, you know, working at one of these ILS vendors like Innovative Interfaces actually was a great education for me. I think I learned, you know, you know, library school is great, but I think I learned, you know, ten times as much about, you know, how things really work and how search interfaces really work by actually working at a software company um, for a couple of years. So it was, it was kind of a great training experience. And then you can see I ended up at San Francisco State for a little while, and and I've been over here at um, San Jose State for about a year and a half. It's um, it's a very interesting place to work. You know, I'm, I'm sure you all know about the whole um, joint library experiment with, between San Jose State and the San Jose Public Library. It's um, um, 
I can't tell you the whole story, but it's it's a very interesting place to work. I, I know it's a beautiful building for you guys to, if you do get a chance to come on campus, it's a beautiful building for you to study at. But um, it's very actually very interesting place to work. But I won't I won't go into too much detail about that. So let's let's start to talk about. Um, you know why? You know I thought libguides would be useful for our library and our library system. And and the way I'm going to do this is I've I've got a few questions that I'm going to ask you guys, and and uh, hopefully I can figure out a way for you to kind of um, give answers. I've, I in my next slide I have the answers that I gave, but I I'm kind of curious to which hear what you guys would say to the, in answer to these questions first, because um, I'm not sure I've got all the right answers. Um, Okay, so let me see. Can I? What should I do, Jeremy? So if somebody's got their hand raised, can I just click and let them give an answer? Uh, hey, John. You know the best way to do this, I think, might be for folks to um, draw out their problem um, on the slide. So if you see on the on the left hand side of the screen, there are text um, annotation tools. Just click on one of those and um, type uh, about your problem. Like that. Okay. So okay. So okay. Go ahead. Okay, so what I'm seeing is people are having trouble figuring out what database to search, how to do figure out credible um, sources. Some, I can't read everything. Let's see. Can I understanding how to search the search use the search systems. Um, um, has is there other other things that people want to say? Hi, that was mine, Sheena. I meant by that one just understanding how to use the database interfaces and understanding how to search the systems. Okay, yeah, that's a good one. Um, and database. Somebody said databases need different. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. I and mean, I think we get a lot of lot of undergrads. I mean, I'm talking. We were asking about undergrads, and so I, I think I've never written a paper before. Is something that a lot of undergrads, um, you know, coming to college these days would experience. Okay, the time. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. That's actually um, when I get to my slide. That's something that I've I've noticed a lot. So has, has everybody who, who wants to um, who wants to give an answer been able to give an answer? Okay, Jeremy. So I'm. Uh, oh, okay. Where, I heard somebody else coming in. Okay, that that's a good question. Um, you know, where to start? So I'm 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 just going to take in all these things. So now now I think I'm going to like show you what I what I came up with when I was kind of sitting down and 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 preparing this demo. Or or it looks like somebody is still is typing here. Uh, okay, so I'm. I'm I'm going to go in then, and people can sort of think about you know what they've thought and and what other people are right here. I'm going to show you kind of what I what I came up with. Um, um, you know the three three big things that I came up with, and kind of in more broader terms, are are, are I I think uh, information overload. And I I just think it, the problem that students have these days is not that they can't find enough. A lot of cases they can't find enough information. They just can't. And I think a lot of the the um, suggestions that people put in the last slides were sort of kind of getting around this idea of information overload, trying to, f to figure out 
the good information from the bad information, or or the library. You know, we have 200 different databases you can search in our on our library website. You know, which database do I choose? Um, is always is always a difficult problem for students, undergraduate students. A second, you know. Big issue, you know, that I I think, you know, based on some research I've I've read, and I'll show you a little bit of the research in the next slide, is is that um, your know, undergraduates, you know, especially in state colleges like San Jose State, you know, are really stressed. I, I, that's that's the perception I get. They they they're, they just they are, they have too many classes. They're working. They're they've got family life and and all kinds of things going on at the same time, and they don't really have a lot of time to. Um, to devote to the research process, or they, or they feel like, they feel like they just, um, they just don't have enough time to, to, you know, to figure, to go to the library website, you know, looking at this, all this overwhelming information, and figure out how to use it. And, and the last thing that I, that this is more, you know, my perception, you know, based on, you know, having a lot of experience in doing research, is the more lack of background knowledge, especially for undergraduates, lack of the understanding of the whole search process um, and in how information is stored and lack of information about the specific topic that, that they're studying um, really hinders undergraduates in the research process. And I think a lot of library resources are built for experienced researchers like, like professors and people who have people who are in graduate school who already know a lot about the subject and, and you know for these people they, it's kind of hard to remember what it's like when you're a student and just starting out without any knowledge of, of how to do research and so I, mean, I think those, those, these three things I think are the kind of the, the big kind of um, problem students face. Now let me just let me um, kind of go on to my next slide. I'm going to show you uh, a specific study, very interesting study that, that, I, that I read recently called How College Students Seek Information in the Digital Age. And I've, at the end of the presentation, I've got a reference to this study. This, it just came out in, in December of last year. And, and I hope Jeremy is able to, to give people the slide, the um, presentation, so you can, if you're interested, you can take a look at this, this study. Um, I've got a link to it at the, at the end of the presentation. And so this study just kind of confirms, you know, what my thinking about what the problems college students are facing. And, and I'll, I don't, I'm not sure the best way to do this, but I think I'll just read the two quotes that I kind of pulled out of it. I kind of focused on information overload. Is, you know, one is that, you know, um, you know, respondents feel frustrated and, and let me just read it from the beginning. I think I'll still use this way to do it. Respondents stated that many of these frustrations were the effects of information overload and the sense of being inundated by all of the resources at their disposal. Frustrations were exacerbated, not resolved, by their lack of familiarity with the rapidly expanding and increasingly complex digital information landscape in which ascertaining the credibility of sources was particularly pro problematic. Um, you know, so I, I think that kind of gets at a lot of the things that what you guys were saying and what I was saying about information overload. And and you know, to be more specific, you know, there, there are challenges that involve narrowing down topics, finding relevant resources, and sorting too, from too many results on online ser searches. Um, so that's some specifics about information overload. And then. Then the study also pointed out some of the time stress problems that I've noticed. Um, they just basically said that, that you know, students felt pressed for time that they juggled for multiple research assignments, and um, and and the very interesting thing to me was that you know, as students you know struggle to meet competing course demands, they feel like they have less time for research, so they rely on predictable research strategies that that had worked for them before. And I think that's, you know, this, this idea that students are ending up just doing, you know, kind of quick and dirty research and they're, they're kind of going through college and, and, and all, their, all their kind of learning how to do is kind of quick and dirty research. It, you know, I, I think that's something that librarians, really important for librarians to think about. Because I think, you know, we, we've got, you know, such an abundance of information that we can give to students these days. If students are just relying on any kind of quick and dirty research strategies, you know, just to get things done as, as fast as possible and doing what they already know, we're not really giving them access to a lot of the you know information resources that we're we're able to provide to them now. Um, let me see what I did next. Uh, 
Uh, did you want, Jeremy? Did you want to say something? Oh no, sorry. I, I tend to do some link spam there during the presentation. Um, the librarian in black actually started uh, at MLK about two years ago, and she's a nice write-up on uh, this pro this study as well. Thank you, Jeremy. I didn't I didn't quite get it. And, you know, maybe I'm, I'd be interested too. So if you could send me again that that um, that um, source, I'd be happy to see it. Um, Another, so, that, so this call, how college students seek information in digital age. This is a very interesting study. I kind of recommend anybody in library school to take a look at this before you start, um, especially if you're interested in working in academic libraries. I think it's kind of really gives you an overview of the, the challenges that we're facing these days in academic libraries. Um, um, and, you know, another book, you know, just to show you a nice little picture here, another book that I've been reading recently is, that came out in 2008 is called The, the Myth of Digital Democracy. And, and, and you know, the thesis of this book is actually that um, you know, even though there are millions of pages on the web, on, on the internet these days, that really there's there's this winner take all dynamics about the internet and so what what this picture is showing you is the top 50 internet sites um, uh, according to in 2007 when this author when this author did this, this study based on um, this company called Hit I think called Hitwise that kind of counts where where people are going on the internet and you, you say these you know, top 50 percent top 50 websites out of the millions of websites on the internet are getting the, the lion's share of almost all the um, internet visits, and, and even more than that, uh, out of the top 50, those, those top 10 sites, it, it, which include Google, Yahoo, MySpace, um, um, this was 2007, I don't know if MySpace is as big anymore, and YouTube are, even, even in just those top 10 internet sites are by far getting um, much more web traffic than the next 40 sites on the internet. So we've got these millions of websites, but really, in a, in a lot of cases, you know, with the, you know, the point that this author makes ca called the myth of digital democracy, just because you can, anybody can publish a web page on the internet doesn't mean that anybody can get their web page read. And most most web pages that get published get up very few viewers. And, and you know, yeah, I mean, actually, somebody well, in the comments, was talking about the blogosphere. This guy also has, an, has a um, chapter on blogs, and you know, there's basically a winner-take-all mechanism in blogs too. That the top few blogs in almost any domain are getting almost all the users, and then there's a huge number of blogs that get you know minimal numbers of readers. And you know, for me, the way this this kind of missing middle and this winner-takes-all dynamics of the internet kind of connects with the problems that college students are having is that you know, if we let our college students kind of get out and graduate from from our colleges with only knowing how to do quick and dirty, you know, kind of research strategies where they feel pressed for time, they don't really understand how to kind of go beyond the the, the quick and easy searches. You know, this area of the internet is where a lot of our our students are going to end up after they graduate. So they're going to have access potentially to millions of websites, but they're going to probably end up letting, you know, maybe Google and Wikipedia do all the filtering for them because that's, you know, the quick and easy way to do, to, do, um, to, um, to get, to narrow down that information overload that they're, that, that they're experiencing. Um, and this is, this probably has nothing to do with live guys, but I just thought this was interesting. This is another, um, this is another um, graphic from that book. Um, um, the myth of digital democracy, and it's kind of showing you what people really are doing on the internet, and and so still today, by far the the number one um, object for people searching on the internet is pornography. Um, um, so this the big slide in the middle, the adult is showing um, basically 10% of all web traffic is going to adult websites or pornography still. I, don't, I mean I don't know what this has to, exactly what this has to do with libraries, but he this guy this author was comparing you know um, looking at you know how people were getting political information from the internet and so political searches or political visits political websites. So that little tiny dot in the middle, which is one tenth of all one tenth of one percent of all um, internet use is going to political websites to get political information. So, you know, basically, what this slide is saying 
is that for every time, every time, every one visit to a political website, there are 100 visits to a um, to a pornography website. So. Um, <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'd be afraid to 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 put academic libraries onto this chart and figure out how small our dot would be. But um, um, but anyway, that's is very interesting. That that um, you know, the web is available for kind of academic research, but that's not you know always how it's used. And if people don't learn how to use it that way when they're in college, it's, it's going to be hard for them to learn. <laughs> Learn how to do, how to. It'll be harder for them to kind of use it in that, that in, the, in that way afterwards. Um, uh, let's see. Do I have some more information here? Okay. So now I'm going back to that study, that 2009 study about how college students seek information. And you know, so you know, we have students who are pressed, have a lot of stress, pressed for time, who are facing information overload. You sort of think you know maybe librarians are people that could help them out with those problems but the interesting thing is at least in that study it's very few people that are very few of the students are actually going to libraries or librarians for for you know for help with these problems they, you know I, I just quoted a couple of things eight out of ten respondents reported that they did not use librarians for help with the course related research and there was a strong librarian student Disconnect occurring among students in their in, in their sample, you know, and and you know, this, you know, you know, despite you know the vast training and expertise that you guys are all getting in your in your SLIS, um, you know, in your SLIS careers, you know, um, um, when you get when you get into working in, in college libraries, at least at the beginning, you know, students are not really. Um, um, Necessarily thinking about coming to us to kind of get help with these problems they're having. Uh, somebody asked, is, you know, if that's age-related. I, I don't, I, I don't know. Um, that may be, a, that may be a lot to do with it. I remember when I was a college student, I actually didn't go to librarians, librarians either for for research assistance. So it, it may be that people just don't know about. Um, uh, um, libraries, but anyway, so that's that's kind of what I want to ask you guys, though. And so my next kind of question is is, um, and this is kind of leading eventually towards um, towards you know, well, I won't uh, put you pull your head too much, but it, I've just sort of so I've kind of outlined you know some issues that students have and some problems that libraries have of kind of reaching helping students with those issues. So I'm I'm just the thing I've been thinking about since I've been in my position here is, you know, what, you know, what can we do? What can lab, academic academic libraries actually do to kind of help um, better help uh, undergraduates with these kind of research problems that they have? And and this is why I'm really hoping that you know, I'm, I'm I've got some answers that I'll give you my ideas in the next slide, but I don't really know the answer. So you know, you know, maybe you guys can really help me out with this one. So I I, I don't know if you want to do it the same way. Um, as we did last time with the last question slide I had, Jeremy, that if we could have just have people write. I'm also willing if people just want to grab the microphone and talk, you know, you go feel free to do that. So I'm going to release the microphone here and let people either talk or or kind of type their suggested answers in, onto the slide here. Hi, this is Anne Marie, and my suggestion is probably by um, building tutorials or videos that better demonstrate how Google search basics transfer to um, the information retrieval system in the libraries. Uh, that would be very helpful. Okay, yeah, thank you, Anne Marie. So it's just so it's kind of tutorials and, and showing how. Uh, Tutorials actually is something I, I I think you guys should be interested in tutorials because you, you focused on why it was something wasn't something that occurred to me when I actually was was working on it. so it's it's good that you guys are reminding me of those. Okay, thank you, Anne Marie. So is, is that mean serve coffee for free?
Okay. I mean, I, actually, it's a good idea. Hey, Jeremy, I'm I'm trying to take notes here, but is is there a way that you can kind of save save the comments for me that are, that got put on the slides um, um, by people writing? Because I'm I, I'm not fast enough to write down all the notes. You know, the session will be recorded, so you can definitely go back to it. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. So, um, can the person who said go where the students are, can um, can you maybe pick up the microphone and elaborate a little bit on that one? That, that sounds interesting, but I'm not quite sure exactly how 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 you're interpreting. That. Okay. Okay, Allison, That's okay. So. Um, But I think I got the idea. It means going out. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I got it. So yeah. So they. I mean, they, yeah. If we go out to the dorms, I mean, we, we, some libraries have tried this kind of going out to the dorms and, and meeting people and um, or going into the classroom uh, also is, is is another possibility. Okay. So it's interesting. More open-ended questions. That's that's actually an interesting one too. And I actually, the, the faculty one is, is another is another good one. That's I, I um, a lot of people have talked about that the you know students students basically do with the, what their teacher what they have to do in order to get good grades in the class. If they're if the faculty are actually telling them to do research or or <coughs> to talk to the library, then then they're going to be much more likely to do that. Um, so. It, Okay. Okay, so these these are all great. Actually, some of them I mean, I've kind of thought about a little bit, but other ones um, uh, I, you know, actually are, are kind of new. New. Uh, okay, assignment course task finders. That's one I actually have thought about, and I, I think that's a great idea. Okay, so um, let me um, okay, let me give people one more. <laughs> that's okay, Rick. Let me give people. Uh, I, I'm going to give people maybe like um, you know one more minute to if they want to type something in, and then I'll kind of go to my slide, my next slide. Oh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm haven't been reading all the comments on the side, but um, somebody mentioned furloughs for librarians. But I mean, at San Jose State, we actually have had furloughs. I'm, I've actually have a furlough day tomorrow. I won't be working tomorrow. I don't. I mean, I, if, you know, people are aware of that. Okay, and I, and I guess I can also say the, um, say the chat. Um, the chat comments after afterwards too, Jeremy. Is that is that correct? Okay. Okay. So let me let me kind of go on to um, um, well, that's that's a good question, Christian. Um, I I think it's going to be tough in the next few years, but um, <laughs> um, I. <laughs> Okay, let me. I'm I'm trying to do too many things at the same time. I'm reading the comments and and trying to think what I'm going to say next. So let me just kind of go to the next slide here. Um, so now these are just my ideas, and and I think a lot of uh, I I'll just kind of go through the the three ideas that I had, and I think in some cases I think I saw some better ideas in in your comments. But you know, one thing I've been 
pushing for for a long time is is actually to kind of you know to do more teaching of the kind of stuff that you guys actually are learning in, in SLIS classes about you know you know um, um, about how information in society and you know how search engines work and 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 I I really I, this is like, this is a kind of controversy I have with some of my colleagues here who, who who think it's not really effective for librarians to teach full you know semester classes to to undergraduates but I I really think that we're getting to a point where we're we're in an information society um, and you know our in a lot of ways our life is kind of our, our our social life and cultural life is kind of dominated by these new information technologies that we have, and uh, librarians might be a good, very good group of people to actually kind of teach people in detail, kind of you know what this means for them and how to how to navigate this kind of environment, and and you know what the kind of info that teaching we do here right now is is basically you know students will come in and, and have maybe an hour and a half or, or or two hours with a librarian during the course of the semester and they can learn how to use one or two databases but I, I don't know if that's enough to really kind of get them to be really competent you know information researchers um, but um, I don't know this that that's just my my goal and I don't know how how realistic it's going to be actually uh, I, some of my colleagues don't really agree with that goal um, another good idea that uh, I saw in a recent study another study on um, that I've, that I've given you a, a reference to at the end of this PowerPoint um, which was actually done at CSU Fresno and CSU Fresno did this long um, cultural study of uh, basically of how students studied and and used the library and 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 one of their recommendations is kind of to you you when we're talking about libraries and offering people you know telling people about the libraries is to kind of to get into the student's head and figuring out what what would kind of what's what their problems are and what would motivate them to come to the library so we got to present the library as a place to you know we say hey stressed we're we're here to help you out you know or 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 kind of you know, go out to people especially at the times when they're they're the most intense and most focused on on, on writing a lot of papers. Um, 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 you know, we can kind of get into their wor world. Um, I think we can be potentially more effective. Um, and, th and then and my third point: integrating libraries into the students' online world into their into their campus resources. I won't talk a lot about that, but I think I think there were some suggestions. Um, um, Along those lines, in 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 the in in what you guys wrote, I mean, I I, I think right now it's it's really hard for the students in general to navigate our our campus online environment. You've got so many different passwords to remember, um, um, so many different systems to use. You've got one password to go on my seat. SJSU, you've got another password to go to SJSU one, you know, to do your to do your wireless the library. You have a separate password, and you know, different things all over the place. I'd I'd really like to get you know, for example, like a list of um, you know, if a teacher's got a list of required readings, you know, if, if some if you, the student can go just one place and get link links to all the library um, databases, both to those specific articles in the library databases. And so there's a lot of things I think we can do to kind of Get library um, library stuff into the students' world, into the into the campus environment better than they are right now. And and these are the kind of things you might be thinking about in terms of interfaces when you're kind of thinking about um, um, interfaces in these classes. You know what you know what what can we as a campus do is, is to, to kind of provide better and more integrated interfaces for uh, for um, for students. Um, um, and then my last two points are are better search interfaces for for lib library resources. Um, um, you know, right now we have 200 different databases. You know, that students can come to the library and look at, and and I think there's, you just get kind of get overwhelmed with you know, with 200 different search interfaces, and the library website is kind of big and unwieldy. Um, so you know, what we're looking at now is kind of more you know kind of Google-like tools to actually search, not what Google searches, but actually our academic, you know, uh, library databases. We actually had a, a vendor um, called EBSCO um, come and give us a demo at our, our library today, and and they've come up with something which they call EBSCO Discovery Services, which is is actually one interface where you can search everything that the library has, you know, books, 
articles, everything in just one search tool. So we're not sending people all over the place to a bunch of different um, different databases and different places to search for different types of material. Um, yeah, I think this is going to kind of help students kind of um, um, you know. Um, Make it a little bit easier to kind of negotiate the library website and library resources. You know, another another thing that you know, one reason Google is so successful with the, with their um, search engine is they kind of use um, kind of social social data to um, you know to recommend websites. So you you know, the top results in Google are are websites that a lot of people link to or a lot of people use, and um, and some library. Um, Database vendors are coming up ways of doing that actually in library systems. And if you, um, I don't know how many have used, how many people here have used our our get text. Are, are people familiar with get text in the uh, from library resources? Yeah. So we we okay. So I see a lot of okay. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. I, I think that Get Text is one of the best tools we offer. But what we've added on, on to Get Text just recently is something called a, a recommender system, which now you can, you can when you when you click the Get Text um, link, you can not only see the the article that you're trying to to get a copy for, but in a lot of cases you'll see um, a link. At the bottom of Get Text, you'll say people who read this article also read these articles, and you'll get a, a list of suggested articles that you can also see. So if you find one good article, we can kind of recommend other articles, not based on keyword searching, but also um, on uh, on. Um, oh, so the good times, yeah. Well, I mean, I Get Text is a useful tool, um, but I. I think um, you know maybe you guys can come up with some ways for making it even more easy easier for um, for non-library stu students to use it. But you know we're kind of getting these kind of systems. Um, so but so now I'm finally get to live, guys. So I think you know you know one thing you know I'm, I've kind of taken a long road to get to live, guys. Here, but I think you know one of the things that I, we we figured that we can do to help students with information overload on the library website, where you've got 200 databases, all kinds of different sources of information, is, is just give them you know give them access to the librarian's knowledge by putting up specific you know websites and web pages that that um, you know point them to specific types of information, so that they're not looking so if a student has to do research for a, a history class, they're not going to the library website and trying to figure out where you would look for history information on the library website, but actually be able to go to one website that'll tell you specifically, you know, here's what the library has to offer for 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 history. And and, you know, potentially going forward, you know, you, we could say, you know, you're in history one oh one or history two hundred, you know, go to a specific website that tells you exactly what the library has to as to offer for you know history 101 or or um, or history 200, and that's kind of what we were looking to for LibGuides. We had commercial, we had subject guides before LibGuides, but they weren't getting used very much, and they were kind of tired, and that's kind of why we thought LibGuides would be a great way to kind of um, um, you know make these things more attractive to students and and give them a way through their kind of information overload in. in in a, in a more attractive interface and something easier for li our librarians to create and easier for students to use. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so I think I've got another question coming up, just to figure out um, how much you guys know about LibGuides. I don't know if you've had an opportunity to look at our LibGuides yet, but I just want to get an idea. Of, I'm, I'll give my answers of what I think the benefits from an, an administrator's perspective of LibGuides in the next slide. But I kind of want to figure out, you know, how much you guys know about them already, and, and what you kind of see as, as, as the features of, of LibGuides, and you know, and kind of how they can kind of solve our, our problems if if you think they can. Um, um, so. Um, I, I guess well, I mean, since I've got you, I'll let people um, um, kind of write on on again on my slide. I'll I'll kind of step back and let people write or, or talk if they have if they want to answer answer the question here.
Okay. And I, I can see we have uh, a kind of uh, a technical crowd as we already get, got to the CMS. Let me let me actually ask ask a different question too. Is um, and people can speak up. I mean, if you've used them, have you? Let me just ask you guys. I'm assuming. I'm, I guess this question kind of assumes that there are features and benefits. I mean, let me ask you guys if you've used them and, and if you actually have found them beneficial for for yourselves. Hey, can I have you guys use your use your check mark um, to indicate whether you have used LibGuides or not? So click on your green check mark if you've used the tool. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. Actually, that's interesting. So um, looks like some looks like a, a majority, but not everybody has seen them. So that that's interesting to me. Maybe actually, um, um, I should have done. A, I mean, maybe I'm assuming that people knew a little bit more than 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 I, um, than they do. I, 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 at the end, there's actually I've got a link. So if people haven't seen the guides, um, at the end of the presentation, there's a, there's a link, and you can kind of take a look and and look around at all the guides and 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 the live guides um, in general site. Yeah, I think um, yeah, I think actually you guys have kind of in this one you've kind of got sort of a lot of the same things that I was thinking about um, in. Um, no, uh, that, well, actually, there's 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 one actually about the best librarians is one I hadn't hadn't thought of. But you guys are kind of getting at a lot of the, the things that I I had in mind. Any anything else? And um, maybe I'll just again I'll kind of give people a little, maybe about 20 seconds more of in case they want to write anything. Okay, let me let me, let me go on to my um, my list here. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, they it's it's you know the first point here is it's it's you know it's a database driven website. It's somebody somebody the first person who commented in the previous slides said CMS. So it's basically a, a CMS system. It's a, it's database driven. So it's not so we're not having to maintain you know you know you know 100 different Separate web pages um, for for a hundred different subjects. You know, we, we're, we're <coughs> we've got our data stored in, in a database, and um, and um, so it's easy easier for um, easier to keep it updated. Um, Oh yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Yeah, CMS for the people that don't know is a content content management system, and I'm I'm sorry that I, I didn't explain that. And and a lot of these content management systems, like blogs and 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 different types of websites, are built on this on, on this underlying architecture, which is you know Apache is a web server, MySQL is a, is a, is an open Apache open source web ser server, MySQL is an open source um, database system, and PHP is an open source programming language that's kind of that kind of that um, that looks at that can work with a MySQL database to kind of create a, a, a you know database driven website for you. And and although you know LibGuys is built on this this architecture, a lot of different websites are built on this architecture these days. And so LibGuys kind of took this architecture and kind of built um, a proprietary site that they, but they're because they built it on this open source free um, um, systems. They're they're able to sell it to us. At a, I, I don't think I can tell you the price, but it's a very very reasonable, not too expensive um, um, solution for us. Um, it's 
it's also hosted by LiveGuides, which means that you know I'm I'm the manager of the, of the IT um, shop here in the library. That means I don't have to buy a server to put in the library and and hire somebody to manage the server and keep it up for us. It's actually um, maintained by LibGuides. It actually uses um, it's uses one of the um, cloud systems. It uses Amazon data services, you know, to to store our data. So we don't have to worry about, you know, keeping the website up or 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 buying equipment for it because it's, it's automatically hosted for us in the clouds. It's it's use because it's becoming a standard, I think there are over 1,000 libraries that use it. Um, even when we were hiring new librarians, they're already, a, you know, Kind of familiar with what LibGuides does and how to do it and how to how to be authors for LibGuides um, and and also because a thousand different libraries are, are using it, it's it's um, it's kind of easy to kind of it's, it's or it's easier to develop best practices. So we can you know when we started out with LibGuides here at San Jose State, there were hundreds of other libraries we kind of look at and decide what works and what doesn't work. And when we were developing our own site, and um, and we can kind of copy things from other libraries because it's a standard. We actually before LibGuides we had our own homemade um, cold fusion database driven kind of um, system for creating subject guides, which had some of the things that LibGuides does, but it was was it was unique just to our library. We had to maintain it with our own IT people. It wasn't as flexible as LibGuides, and 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 was harder to use and and harder to adapt, you know, than LibGuides are. Um, so with ra rapid and flexible deployment, I um, and this is something you may not be able to see just by looking at the LibGuides is that. Once one libguide has been set up, or one box on a libguide has been set up, it's easy for somebody else to to copy and copy an existing libguide site and and then modify it. So I um, I actually used libguides at San Francisco State before I came here. And I I would teach classes maybe you know five or six times a semester. And I would be able to create a, a a separate libguide for every single class. Not like you know you know coding a website and putting up a website which might take a lot of time. I could I could pick probably put together in in about once you learn it about an hour and a half I could put together a libguide for a specific class. That it allowed me to, you know, not just put up one libguide for a specific subject and just leave it there, you know, for years and update it gradually. I was able to, you know, every single class I took I could I could put together a libguide focused specifically on, on what what um, what that class wanted. Um, I already talked about sharing and copying good ideas um, and easy to modify and um, based on feedback. And I'm sure you have all heard about Web 2.0 stuff. I'm a little bit, you know, I'm a little bit less of an enthusiast uh, about Web 2.0 stuff than some people are. Um, you know, I I when we turn on the comments, very few people actually comment on the web, web guides, but I, I like the, thing, the fact that it's very easy to put in videos or to create RSS feeds and add RSS feeds to, to the guides. And, um, and um, I kind of wish I would have showed it to you first, for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, but you'll, 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 um, hopefully, you'll, it, those of you who haven't seen the guides will have a chance at the to to look at this presentation later and go take a look and sort of see what they look like and what I'm talking about. Um, um, so how do I how do I acknowledge a, a hand raised? Yeah, that's about it. Just let off your microphone. You know, if you want to, uh, if you want to get fancy, we could do some application sharing and you could show us a libguide. Um, I know we didn't talk about this beforehand, so just give it a thought, and we would start up application sharing and see basically your your desktop. Okay, where do I get the application sharing? Um? Sure, that's under Tools, Application Sharing, um, Share Application, and then choose uh, Firefox or Internet Explorer. So first off, you want to go there. Yeah, there you go. Cool. So go to a libguide and show us around.
Okay, so you, I think you guys can still hear me, and let me kind of go into a new tab here. So this is um, this is right here. Um, let me just. Oops. Okay, can can you guys actually see the lid guides right now? Okay, okay, good. So th this is just the home page. We don't really use this too much, but um, um, you know, for example, I mean, this is just an example of a libguide, and they all, they all kind of look like this. You know, it's very easy to create this this, this kind of tabbed interface, um, um, and it kind of highlights the librarian. For example, here's our government documents librarian, Sue Kendall, right here, and she's actually added um, a widget so that you can talk to her directly from the libguide. That's kind of a Web 2.0 feature that's kind of added, and and what is it? You know what it's mainly used for is kind of to identify specific sources. So you know, you know, government documents actually is a good one to look at because I think a lot of people are are challenged by looking for government documents. So she can actually tell you, okay, if you want to look for California state government documents, instead of going to our whole website or, or talking to somebody, she can kind of just highlight, you know, di you know, different types of of, of California state government documents. Um, so I'm gonna somebody's got their hand raised. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, Turn off the microphone and let you talk. Who else has the hand raised? Go ahead, Claire. Okay, so I, I'm I'm not sure if Claire actually wanted to talk, so I'm just going to continue. So. Um, Um, so I, I, so you you get a basic idea here. I mean, I think if I go go to the LibGuide's home, what you'll especially be interested to see is if, if you haven't seen it already, is the um, Library and Information Science LibGuide. Um, this is done by Lorraine Sisson, who's our 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 liaison to the Library and Information Science. Um, department, and she's put together a very nice libguide. Um, you know, so if you haven't met Lorraine yet, I mean, she, Lorraine herself is a great resource for you during the course of your career as as a student. Um, uh, and she's 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 always willing to help librarians. And you know, so she's got. You know, you guys are experts in lots, but she's got the library orientation material here. Um, she's. She's actually put a, um, a you know a widget so that you can search our 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 federated search tool, the cross search, right here with with specific library um, databases, you know, right from her libguide. So there's, there's a kind of a way of helping you with um, the information overload you may have from all, the, all of the, our 200 databases. She's telling you, you know, here are these five databases that are are particularly good for for um, libguides. Um, so I mean, you get a general idea. I'm not going to show you around too much, but I mean, the nice thing about it is. These are pretty, you know, pretty clear websites. You know, f you know, fairly sophisticated information. And you know, once you learn how to do it, they're very fast to to actually create. Um, so you could do one specifically for a course. Um, now I'm going to look and see. I'm going to go to LibGuide's home and search for course guides. I want to see if there are any course guides. That's the people still have that. No, I didn't do it. I didn't do a good search here because these are are finding diff different guys that just have. Okay, so here's here's one right here. So here's you know a specific, not just a subject, but a specific class. Um, 
in in um, at San Jose State Health Science One, and and the uh, librarian has put together a live guide specifically for for. Um, for this class, so you can see that she's kind of embedded video. So we've, we're doing these online these, these um, tutorials in, in Captivate, and she's kind of embedded that that right into the LibGuide, so the students can kind of get started just by looking at a, um, a tutorial. And she's add, added added um, um, you know things you know specifically for this one. Well, actually, not she. So I don't even know who that picture is. I, I, that may be the picture of the professor of the class there. I'm, I'm learning something right here. But um, so you, I think I think that's enough that you can kind of get the general idea. So I'm, I, I um, if you want to go, let me just type in for you guys you know, to just to go if you want to go back and look at it. I've got the references at the end, but just go to that. Um, Go to that URL and, and you'll kind of get in the lib guides. And I'm, I, I think it's it's pretty you know the interface for students is pretty straightforward and let you experience it on your own. I, I don't know if Jeremy will give you an assignment later on where he'll ask you to kind of pull apart the lib guides interface the same way you've done with the the watch tutorial. But um, if he does, I'd be kind of interested to see what see what you come up with, what works and what what doesn't work. Um, so I'm. So I'm going to go back and just kind of finish up my um, slide. I think I've kind of, I think I've, I hopefully I've kind of given you a flavor and a general idea of what I'm talking about with the LibGuides and what what we're trying to do with that. Um, so Judy asked, how much customization can be done? So let me kind of show you this. So. The customization that's available to to the individual librarian is kind of is basically how many tabs they want to do, you know, what size boxes they want to do, how many boxes they want to do, kind of the color, the look and feel of the boxes. There are different style boxes they can put. Um, the customization that we've kind of done for the library as a whole, you know, you see that we put our our header and footer in, um, but it's not. It's not really extensive customization. That one reason why it's is actually, you know, I think there's always a trade-off for for content management systems between, you know, how much customization you can do and and, and you know how easy they are to learn and how easy they are to use. So what LibGuides is is offering kind of a limited amount of customization. You're not going to see a LibGuides site that doesn't have these kind of tabs across the top like this. Um, um, yeah, well, that, that's another good point too. Is that you know, if, if they all looked very different, then you know, it might be hard for people to, to figure them out. But um, it's also because you don't have a lot of customization. You, or you have, I, I won't say not a lot of customization. It's kind of a minimal or, or middle level of customization. This is specifically made. You know, this tool is specifically made to create either you know course guides or subject guides for libraries. It you know you could. If you wanted to, you could make other kinds of websites with it, but you know it's really oriented towards making course guides and, and library guides or, or subject guides. And so, it's, because it has a very specific purpose, it's the amount of flexibility is limited, but also makes it um, much easier for our librarians to learn how to use it and actually, you know, makes it possible for them to deploy it faster. So that's kind of the trade-off you get between um, customization and, and 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 flexibility. So. Um, um, hopefully, in your careers, you'll you'll get an opportunity. And, I, and, and Jeremy, actually, I thought, are you are you going to give them a chance to to set up test lib guides in, in the course, Jeremy? I, I thought you mentioned something about that. You know, I was working on that with my 287 course, my other course, my web uh, uh, new web course. But I think anybody who is you know, anybody can set up um, a demo libguide. So, actually, if anybody wants to fiddle around with it for for one of the upcoming assignments, you can you can certainly do that. Okay, so now I'm going to go back. I'm going to try to figure out how do I get back to my um, my PowerPoint PowerPoint journey. Um, so I want to go away from application sharing here. Yeah, I think if you choose application sharing, um, 
take away control of shared applications, something like that. Let me see here. Okay, I think I'm. Are Are you guys seeing the? Are you guys back to seeing the PowerPoint now? Okay, good, good. Um, so let me see. Um, Okay, actually, I've forgotten that I had put in a few pictures, too, in my PowerPoint. So I kind of showed you specific guides. Another thing that I like about it is, is it actually it's a way of kind of um, getting our librarians out there and, and you, know, um, you know, make it easier for, for people to find them. So, so for every single author in LibGuides, they have their own profile page where so you can see Valeria, who's one of our um, new librarians who just started last year. And you can see all the guides that she's created from on her on her on her page and, and all of her contact information. And I, I put Valeria's out there because she actually since LibGuides have gone up, she's actually been noticed on campus. So a couple of students have actually stopped Stopped her, you know, walking across campus, and said, "Oh, yeah, I, I, I recognize you. I saw your, I saw your picture up on, 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 on the website." Um, she actually, um, I was actually very happy about it. She was, she was actually a little bit concerned about it, but um, it at least it's kind of, you know, kind of hopefully it's kind of getting our librarians out there and making them a little bit more noticeable on campus. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't think they're stalkers. I hope they're not stalkers. <laughs> um, um, okay, so this this is I was I was trying to find a specific course guide when I was on the site, and I really like specific course guides because I think that really more than anything helps students you know with their information overload because we're we're not telling them you know here are your education resources here are the resources that you need to use or you can use for your specific class. I think that's the kind of help that that um, students really can that can really be a benefit to students. So she, she's actually she's actually put the syllabus for the class onto her onto um, the live guide for this class and, and the course reader. Um, you know, some of our librarians have, have have not only put the syllabus onto the live guide, but actually have put links to every single article uh, on the live guide into the databases. So that all the student has to do is come to the live guide, and they've got a link to every single required reading that they need for the class. Not too many librarians have done that, but that's a possibility that you can do with, with LibGuides. Um, and oh, here's the um, SLIS guide I kind of showed you a little bit before. You, you can go back, you can go ahead and back to it later on and kind of take a look around. Um, okay, so I'm I'm going to let you guys. You know, since you guys are are experts in interface design and are becoming experts in interface design, I'm maybe just going to ask you if you guys see any problems or what kind of problems you've noticed with it. Because I've I've got a slide where I, I've kind of talked about the things I've noticed, but um, okay. So cookie cutter being that they. Um, they all look the same and um, kind of maybe a kind of a boring interface. Is that kind of the suggestion there? Um, oh yeah, um, that's a good question. So um, you know, in the CSUs, we we've got a requirement in some at some point in the future that you know everything has to perform well and 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 be 508 compliant and work in screen readers. LibGuides right now they they didn't pass our test in terms of of, of accessibility. Um, um, what you but they they're promising the company called SpringShare is promising that they're they're working on that and that they'll be um, accessible in the near future. Um, and what what they offer right now is you if you um, if you go into a libguide and you actually go to the print version, they say that's that that works well for um, for for um, accessibility. So, um, but that's a good point. So um, maybe I'm not quite understanding the as searchable as Google comment. Can and whoever wrote that kind of elaborate on that one? Okay. 
Okay, so so Jeremy, you you put in the Google one. Yeah, the the searchable the search interface doesn't work too great. It finds specific pages, um, um, and I don't think there's there's any relevancy ranking in in um, in LibGuides. So you know, basically, it's just giving you a list of all the pages. So there's no uh, there's no kind of relevancy ranking that as Google does. Um, so let me see if I can go back and look at this. Yeah, I mean, again, that the one about you know different different creators using doing things differently is that's kind of the the trade-off between giving the flexibility to let people do it their own way, and and then um, I'd be kind of interested if if it's more important to make them consistent or is more important to kind of let people kind of do different things depending on what the subject is. Hmm. So, put put so I'm also the post librarian in hierarchy with students. Is that is the point that it, it um, actually I'm not quite getting the point of librarian hierarchy with students. It's sort of same saying, saying that the, um, the it's giving the li librarian too much authority to tell the students what what they should be doing. Okay, so yeah, well, I mean, actually, actually, Jeremy, in, there is uh, the ability to make comments or 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 suggestions if if the librarian chooses to turn it on. A lot of them haven't chosen to turn on the comments, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's not as not as democratic as a wiki, obviously, but um, there is there is the possibility that students can comment if uh, if the librarian chooses to turn it on. It's kind of interesting that most of our librarians have decided that they don't they've turned off the comments for some reason. Yeah, that comment up at the top is, is a good one. Yeah, so, so you know, they're not always clear which libguide. So, you know, even even if we're we're telling you, you know, this is what you want to use for English and this is what you want to use for history, um, we haven't completely solved the. And I don't think there's any, I don't think there's any one way to completely solve the information overload problem. But it, it's a yeah, it's a good point. So let me. Um, so all these are great. So I'm I'm hope I'm I'm going to go back and 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 try to um, um, get notes on all these um, um, when I go back and and review the presentation. So I'll just give another minute for people to add things if if they. Um, so I'll I'll just kind of wait for maybe 30 or 40 seconds and let people who who still want to type something in. Okay, so I'm I'm going to go on now, show you what, in in my perspective, may be a little bit different because I'm I'm not looking at them only as a user, but also as somebody who's the kind of managed librarians who are working on on the libguide. So, um, so what I've discovered so far is that, you know, even though you know when we got libguides, we thought this was going to be really easy, so that rather than having the web team create all the guides for our librarians, the librarians would be doing it themselves um, because this is such an easy web interface um, tool. But I found out even with libguides, even with the, the, the editing, um, even with the ease of use of libguides, you know, some of our librarians, especially some of the librarians who have been here for a while, still have a lot of trouble actually figuring out how to do them. And, um, and and I think that kind of gets at some of the points that were made in the last section is that you know people people um, have found you know by live guys tend to get out of out of date and are not updated. It's kind of hard to to if you've got 20 different people maintaining you know 100 different live guys. It's, it's kind of hard to kind of get every day on the same page and and making sure that they're uh, understanding how to update their live guides and. Using the tools that 
LibDrive makes available to kind of check links and make sure things still work, it's still a little bit of a challenge to get everybody um, everybody um, um, keeping the LibDrive up to date. Um, you know, another one, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware of it, but we've, we're engaged in this kind of long-term project to to um, upgrade and, and redesign our website, and, and we're running into a lot of questions of of uh, you know what content belongs in the lib guide and what content belongs on our new website because um, you know our librarians are figuring out the lib guides are a very easy way to kind of get stuff up on the web so they're wanting to put everything up in the lib guide and we have to try to make some decisions within the library about you know what really goes there and and you know what what we can do better in our, our in our new website um, um, and. You know, my bullet point here about proliferation of libguides kind of corresponds to what somebody said in the in the in the previous slide about you know you know we can get to another kind of information level though just by having you know 200 libguides you know is 200 libguides easier to use than 200 different databases? Um, um, yeah, actually, I'll get to Lauren's point. Um, um, which is actually correct, um, the way we implement it here. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and the other thing is, you know, is now that, you know, our goal was to have, you know, our librarians who are sort of the content um, experts for different subjects, you know, maintain the, all the libguides themselves, but that kind of gives, gives our web team a little bit less control of what's going up and, and on our website and, and what's being displayed and uh, makes you know makes it a little bit hard to, harder to keep things up to date. So those are the problems I've noticed with LibGuides from from our perspective. Um, and I think some of them correspond to the kind of the things that you pointed out from from the user's perspective as well. Um, okay, so let me just tell you quickly how we how we did it at, at um, um, at SJSU, and, and um, we we decided to give libguides about a year ago, I think, and 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 you know my boss, the library dean, said, well, we've got libguides, we've got to get them available by fall of 2009. So we gave our librarians a hard deadline, and I think actually that's a very effective way to actually get things done in time. I think um, I've noticed in my experience here at San Jose State, I've worked on two kind of big web projects, the LibGuys and our library website redesign. And, and in our library website redesign, the, the deadline is kind of ambiguous and keeps changing and we've been working on it for a year and a half and we're still not finished. With LibGuys, we we got it. We said we were going to do it in about four months, and we actually got it up. There were some problems. But we actually did it. So I, I'm finding that hard deadlines a lot of times are, are effective at, at doing it. Um, and then the second point gets to what Warren was suggesting in the comments is that we knew we weren't going to train all of our librarians to to um, to learn libguides by the time by the four month deadline we had. So we we basically we provided a lot of help. By, uh, with our interns, um, some of our student employees here were actually much faster at at, at um, learning the libguides than the librarians. So it, we did a lot of teamwork where where we had an editor who kind of knew how to do libguides working with the subject librarian who um, who knew the subject area, and that was that kind of helped us get things. But that's kind of leading us to problem now is you know is what are we going to do to kind of keep these libguides maintained and up to date because. A lot of our librarians didn't actually learn how to do them, so are we going? It may, from our perspective, it may be a long-term thing where we're going to have to have students or interns, you know, working on these things to keep them up to date. Um, oh, and the other big issue we had with the flip guides, and, and I don't know if I really want to get into this now, is that um, we had a different system of doing um, A to Z list of our databases, our own homemade. Um, um, a cold fusion database of databases that where we listed our databases in the past, um, and 
we, we discovered that the hardest, one of the hardest things for our librarians to do when they're creating libguides and adding links to databases is, is figuring out the right way to, to link to a database. Because we're going, you know, to get to our databases, you're going to our, um, our proxy server. A lot of the databases are very, um, has some authentication information in the um, URL that we're using to get to the database. So it's, 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 it's kind of hard for our librarians to figure out the right way to link to the database. So what we wanted to do was to give them a way to just copy a master list of databases when they're creating links in a specific guide. So we decided to move our A to Z list of databases to a libguide. Um, and you'll notice now, if you go to our library website, um, um, and, and, and look at the, just see SJSU databases, that will actually take you to a specific libguide that, that just, you know, lists all of our databases that we have access to. Um, that made, we can use, now we can use that libguide list of data, yeah, thank you, thank you, Alyssa. Um, we can use that libguide list of databases as kind of a master list so that whenever a librarian is creating a link to a database in a specific guide, they're actually copying that A to Z list. Um, there are pros and cons to this too. I think it, it caused, you know, when we, when we implemented it, libguides, I think it caused a lot of consternation to some of our reference librarians who were using our old A to Z list and were, um, had to get used to the new A to Z list. I'm still, I'm still wondering if that A to Z list is, is maybe one of the least um, usable parts of our libguide. So, you know, maybe if you guys are focusing on interface design, maybe you could also take a look at that um, A to Z list and kind of give me some suggestions about whether whether you think that works as well. But we, that's one thing we had to do to kind of get this implemented quickly on on our website. Um, let me see. Look at my rest of my slides. See what else I have to say. Um, um, I don't know. I'm it's getting close to eight, um, I, it's getting close to eight o'clock right now. Let me see what else do I have. So, okay, I, these, these are just some ideas I had. I, what I'm thinking right now is I'm getting tired of talking. So I think what I'm going to do is just kind of finish my presentation here. Here are the reference I mentioned. You know, this this first one, how college students seek information in digital ages, I think is a really great. Um, paper that y you all should read, and the library study at Fresno State also is very interesting too. So I, I recommend those two, two um, references highly. This, if you're kind of curious about you know how much pornography people are looking at online, this myth of digital democracy is also interesting. But I'm just finishing up my presentation, so I'm going to give you know give you guys you know 20 minutes or so if you want to just to ask me questions either about libguides or laws or I'll I'll kind of open it up and kind of give myself a break of from talking and let you let you ask questions if you want to someone had mentioned that they had implemented a libguide system at their university and I I don't remember who it was it was up in the A's I think um, if you've implemented or, or uh, managed a libguide system, um, tell us how it went. Judy asks, does it come with usage statistics? So what kind of background, uh, what, are the, what are the metrics from the system? Yes, um, we can um, look at statistics for each guide and each link. So um, each author of a libguide can go and look at their libguide and see, um, um, check their their head counts and see how many people are using it. And um, the, our our administrator can go and look at the entire um, libguides. And I was thinking about actually reviewing the statistics before I came to talk to you today and kind of telling you what they were, but I just didn't have time to get to them. But um, we can look at the statistics, and, and they're actually getting used pretty well right now, especially that A to Z list, because we're, we're a lot of ways we're really forcing people to use that if they want to kind of see our list of databases. But um, it's, it's pretty easy to use the statistics. I think our web team has also added um, um, Google Analytics to our libguides. Um, if you're familiar with Google Analytics, it's, it's a free tool that um, Google offers to, um, to website developers to, to see the statistics on their website. Um, and so um, our web team has been able to add that to libguides as well. Um, 
I haven't had a chance yet to go and look at our um, Google Analytics statistics um, yet, but um, so they they have it has its own native statistics, and you can also add things like Google Analytics um, to get statistical information. Google Analytics is great because it's it's extremely fast to set up. Um, gives you a little snippet. Well, okay, so you register, you tell it what page you're you're gonna um, uh, analyze, and then it gives you a little snippet of code, and you hide that in the HTML for the page, and then. Um, Whenever the page runs, it tells Google, and Google sets up some really beautiful charts and graphs. It's a great system, and it's free. Yeah, I, I agree, Jeremy. We've we've put it on our library website. We've got on our library, you know, OPAC catalog, and um, also on on LibGuys. And so it's it's better than the um, the paid um, statistics that we used to we used to pay for. So Anne Marie, do you want to go into a little bit more detail about setting goals and segmentation? Darn, I was hoping to get to slip that in. Um, well, yeah, I'm actually uh, working on web analytics and um, taking a course from Google's um, Google Analytics chief evangelist Avinash Kashik, and his blog is incredible in terms of content. But the key is um, when using uh, Google Analytics is to go beyond clickstream data, which is typically how many hits, how many pages per view, um, et cetera, and look at what are key goals for, for example, a LibGuide site. So would it be um, a degree of engagement would you look at uh, visitor loyalty, and that might be a metric that's more uh, effective for you, or um, recency of visit, um, time on page versus average time on site. So you're not getting, um, you get, you're looking at better distribution um, when you choose that. So it really comes down to you know segmenting your users um, to identify you know, geographically where they come from. So you're looking at demographics um, and social graphics. And you can even go as far with segmentation to get psychographics. Well, that's, that's great information. Thanks. I, 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 so far, I basically just look at the picture, pretty pictures on the dashboards and, and, and try to figure out that. <laughs> um, so it's. it's um, um, yeah, you know, maybe we should, maybe we could even um, hire you, uh, or well, I shouldn't say hire because we can't hire anybody right now. But I, 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 that's that's really useful information. Yes, yeah, somebody else. Um, it might have been somebody in this class, or it might have been somebody in another in my 27. I'm sorry. Asked me for internship opportunities, and he he was working in Reno, or I'm sorry, Chico, and he wanted. Um, distant internship opportunities, and so I sent him to um, uh, Lorene Sisson. But I'm sure that there are uh, other uh, internship opportunities at the library, and some, some more technical stuff. Oh, thanks, James. I'm sorry. So um, yeah, if anybody's interested in internships, I'll bet something could be arranged at the library to deal with uh, analytics. Yeah, actually, I've, I haven't had time for interns since I've been here, but um, you know, maybe we should talk later, Jeremy, and 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 if you if you have some ideas or you have some students who are interested, let's let's talk about that, um, and um, maybe we can put some some things together. Can we talk a little bit about lots? Um, I know that you weren't involved in the creation of it; it's been a few years now, but. Um, I don't know if everybody knew this. We've done surveys of students in our two or three, the orientation and intake course, and lots comes up number two behind the Illuminate training. So if anybody here has taken the two or three, you'll know that uh, lots is one of the ten modules, and um, generates a, a decent amount of grumbling. But I guess afterwards, people say that it was, you know, in the top two for for most usable resource. So. Um, what were some general impressions that people had that they want to forward to John about lots and about ways that uh, might be interesting now that we're in the process of sort of suggesting sketches and, and new designs? What, uh, what do you suggest, all of you?
Okay, so I got the larger font, huh? Can you um, can you expand on that, um, Rick? So what what's the what are the accessibility problems that that you said? Okay, pop-ups. You know, actually, we could go on and on and on with the specifics, but it might be interesting. And and I actually have those in in document form from the previous class, the accessibility issues, and I sent those, some of those to Lorene. But um, there are probably we probably undercovered a hundred, at least a hundred uh, usability issues, and probably a couple of dozen in serious access, um, should sorry, um, accessibility issues. So. Yeah, the system definitely has a lot of room for improvement. And I think our, st our students are in the process of sketching up improvements and suggestions. But I'm curious what you all think is the difference between libguides and lots. And um, other than quality and, and specific problems, who are the audiences and how are the different tools? And, and while people are thinking about that, I, I'll, I'll have to admit that because Jeremy mentioned lots, I actually did the lots tutorial. I hadn't actually looked at it too much. Um, I think lots is, um, to me, lots is, is would be a very difficult and and challenging to keep maintained because it's taking you to specific databases, and those databases are changing all the time. And it's asking you questions about things that are going to change constantly. So I, I. Um, I just think my my impression is lots of something that's really hard to to keep up to date, and I was trying I was trying to do something that I think is is um, that you can't really do any other way if, if, other than you know in person actually teaching people how to use a database you know in person in a class. I think that's a very important point, and 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 as we go into the third phase, the design phase. Well, I should say the implementation phase. Looking looking at ways to keep it maintainable um, is kind of a crucial concern. I think uh, limiting the, the the cost of doing the thing. So obviously you don't have unlimited resources in terms of coders and all that, but also making it maintainable over time. So the cost of this tool is not necessarily just doing it up front. The cost is two, three, four years later the continued maintenance of this and keeping a staff person on, you know, even even one twentieth time to to maintain it is a real pain. I saw there was some discussion about you know doing lots and libguides. There are lots of different kind of modules in libguides. I mean, I hadn't I didn't really looked at lots too much, but I mean, there's some ways of doing quizzes and those kinds of things in libguides. I don't know if it could be done exactly the same way as lots, but um, you, you might be able to do some of these kind of lots thing in libguides. It won't be as interactive. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's a big difference. Is one is one is instructional, has a goal, and the other one, well, one is is a segmented piece of content, and the other one is is sort of browsable. It's the difference between uh, walking through a maze uh, and coming to a buffet. Okay, so that's an interesting point. Is is there problems of the usability problems with libguides? You know, and actually, for the uh, for the for the fi final project and presentation, if, if somebody wants to tackle all three phases using lots, or I'm sorry, libguides, that'd be good too. That'd be a good project to evaluate it, uh, design it, and implement it. Well, thank you very much, John. I really, really appreciate your time, and we have a recording of this one going. And also, I will take uh, um, the text um, from chat and, and send it off to you as an email as well. 
I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. I, I enjoyed it. I hope, hope, hopefully people um, learn, learn some things. And, um, and I'm, I actually probably learned a lot more than, than the students did. So I, it was, it's been very helpful for me, too. And so I, mean, I really would like to come back. And I'd also be kind of curious if, if any of your students do you know, you know, study on LibGuys. I, I might be interested in seeing that as well. Okay, if anybody doesn't have any more questions, let's uh, wrap it up for tonight.